So welcome everybody. I think we all um, shared our sort of mixed feelings about it. It's exciting to be here, but it's sad to see this wonderful program wrapping up. Um, this is the second to the last week. And um, I do wanna thank everybody for, um, for all of your contributions. It's made a big difference in the library's budget. Grateful for that. And um, I'd also like to mention that um, next week, Roxana has said that the class will run until six. Um, we already pushed it from five to 5.30 because there was so much to talk about. And for the last session, we'll go to six because we really do wanna make sure everybody gets their, their thoughts in and, and we, can, we can share everybody's ideas. So um, I, think, I think that's it for me, Roxana. Are you ready to get started? I am ready. Okay, great, thank you. So welcome everyone to part seven. I'm Roxana Robinson, this is from YouTube. Um, and we're reading part seven of Anna Karenina. And uh, yes, next week for anyone who wants to stay on for the final, a final half hour, I just wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to say whatever they want about this great novel. And I wanna tell you how much I have enjoyed having all of you part of this. Your comments, your responses, your, I can see your faces. I love seeing your, your reactions to all of this. So you've made a big difference to me. This would be a very different experience for me if I was simply sitting in front of a camera. I'm not, I'm sitting in front of all of you. So thank you for your responses. So part seven, really such an emotionally turbulent section of this book. It's kind of, uh, I won't say carnival because that suggests a kind of lightness it doesn't have, but it's maybe a war zone. Th this is the most powerful part of the book in which um, Tolstoy returns to the great themes that we've talked about. And remember the aspects of the narrative itself, the, the writing, um, our velocity and empathy and intensity, but the themes that he's been returning to um, include some of these that this section is about, birth and death, jealousy, family. Um, so I will, I will read a bit and from this section and then I'll, and I'll talk about the parts that I read as always and then I'll tell you some more about Tolstoy's own um, personal connection to the events of this book. I'm gonna start on um, page 713 for anyone who wants to um, follow along. And you know, I skim and skip because Tolstoy tends to be repetitive a little bit. So um, I'll start on 713 and I'm gonna to skip to 714. And this is Kitty's birth and the birth of Kitty's first child. And I remember that earlier, uh, somebody asked why, um, why there was such a very deeply described and, and intimately experienced scene about death, but that the birth of Anna's child was skimmed over. And I said to all of you, we were gonna have a, a scene about birth later on, which is not skimmed over. And one of the things about this scene, for anyone who has ever been party to a birth, either the woman giving birth or somebody watching, you know how excruciatingly long the event is. It seems as though it will never ever be over. And so Tolstoy, sometimes we, we complain about him because he, uh, like the scene about the Zemstvo, that also seems it will, as though it will never be over or the political arguments. But he goes into things with such enormous depth and, and um, intensity and, and eagerness to experience every part of it. So that this scene, he in this scene, he really delivers this sense of the endless um, anxiety and fear and excitement and boredom of death, of, of birth, which takes so, so, so long and Levin has never experienced it before. So starting on page 713, he knew and felt only that what was being accomplished was similar to what had been accomplished a year ago in a hotel in a provincial capital on the deathbed of his brother, Nikolai. But that had been grief and this was joy. But that grief and this joy were equally outside all ordinary circumstances of life, were like holes in this ordinary life. 
through which something higher showed. And just as painful as tormenting in its coming was what was now being accomplished. And just as inconceivably in contemplating this higher thing, the soul rose to such heights as it had never known before, where reason was no longer able to overtake it. Lord, forgive us and help us, he constantly repeated to himself, fe feeling in spite of so long and seemingly so complete an estrangement that he was turning to God just as trustfully and as simply as in his childhood and early youth. Now I'm moving to the next page. He did not know whether it was late or early. The candles were all burning low. Dolly had just come to the study to suggest that the doctor lie down. Levin listened to the doctor tell about a crack mesmerist watching the ashes of his cigarette. It was a period of rest and he had become oblivious. He had entirely forgotten what was going on now. He listened to the doctor's story and understood it. Suddenly there was a scream unlike anything he had ever heard. The scream was so terrible that Levin did not even jump up but holding his breath gave the doctor a frightened questioning look. The doctor cocked his head to one side listened and smiled approvingly. It was all so extraordinary that nothing any longer astonished Levin. Probably it should be so, he thought, and went on sitting. Whose scream was it? He jumped up, ran out on tiptoe to the bedroom, went round Lizaveta Petrovna and the princess and stood in his place at the head of the bed. The screaming had ceased, but something had changed now. What? He did not see or understand, nor did he want to see and understand. But he saw it from Lizaveta Petrovna's face. Her face was stern and pale and still just as resolute, though her jaws twitched a little and her eyes were fixed on Kitty. Kitty's burning, tormented face with a strand of hair stuck to her sweaty forehead was turned to him and sought his eyes. Her raised hands asked for him, his. Seizing his hands in her sweaty hands, she started pressing them to her face. Don't leave, don't leave, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, she spoke quickly. Mama, take my earrings, they bother me. You're not afraid. Soon, Lizaveta Petrovna, soon. She spoke quickly, quickly and tried to smile, but suddenly her face became distorted and she pushed him away from her. No, it's terrible, I'll die, I'll die, go, go, she cried. And again came that scream that was unlike anything in the world. Levin clutched his head and ran out of the room. Never mind, never mind, it's all right, Dolly said after him. But whatever they said, he knew that all was now lost. Leaning his head against the doorpost, he stood in the next room and heard a shrieking and howling, such as he had never heard before. And he knew that these cries were coming from what had once been Kitty. He had long ceased wishing for the child. He now hated this child. He did not even wish for her to live now. He only wished for an end to this terrible suffering. Doctor, what is it? What is it? My God, he said, seizing the doctor by the arm as he came in. It's nearly over, said the doctor. And the doctor's face was so serious as he said it that Levin understood this nearly over to mean that she was dying. Forgetting himself, he ran into the bedroom. The first thing he saw was Lizaveta Petrovna's face. It was still more stern and frowning. Kitty's face was not there. In place of it, where it used to be was something dreadful, both in its strained look and in the sound that came from it. He leaned his head against the wooden bedstead, feeling that his heart was bursting. The terrible screaming would not stop. It, st it became still more terrible and then as if reaching the final limit of the terrible, it suddenly stopped. Levin did not believe his ears, but there could be no doubt. The screaming stopped and there was a quiet stirring, a rustle and quick breathing and her faltering, alive, gentle and happy voice softly said, it's over. He raised his head her arms resting strengthlessly on the blanket, remarkably beautiful and quiet. She silently looked at him and tried, but was unable to smile. 
and suddenly from that mysterious and terrible unearthly world in which he had lived for those 22 hours, Levin felt himself instantly transported into the former ordinary world, but radiant now with such a new light of happiness that he could not bear it. The taut strings all snapped. Sobs and tears of joy, which he would never have foreseen, rose in him with such force, heaving his whole body, that for a long time they prevented him from speaking. Falling on his knees beside the bed, he held his wife's hands to his lips, kissing it, and the hand responded to his kisses with a weak movement of the fingers. And meanwhile, there at the foot of the bed, in the deft hands of Lizaveta Petrovna, like a small flame over a lamp, wavered the life of a human being who had never existed before and who, with the same right, with the same importance for itself, would live and produce its own kind. Alive, alive, and it's a boy. Don't worry, Levin heard the voice of Lizaveta Petrovna, who was slapping the baby's back with a trembling hand. Mama, is it true? said Kitty's voice. She was answered only by the princess's sobs. And amidst the silence, as the indubitable reply to the mother's question, a voice was heard, quite different from all the subdued voices speaking in the room. It was a bold, brazen cry, not intent on understanding anything, of a new human being who had appeared incomprehensibly from somewhere. Earlier, if Levin had been told that Kitty had died and that he had died with her, and that they had angels for children, and that God was there before them, none of it would have surprised him. But now, coming, having come back to the world of reality, he made men, great mental efforts to understand that she was alive and well, and that the being, shrieking so desperately, was his son. Kitty was alive, her sufferings were over, and he was inexpressibly happy. That he understood, and in that he was fully happy. But the baby? Whence, why, and who was he? He simply could not understand, could not get accustomed to this thought. It seemed to him something superfluous, an overabundance, and for a long time, he could not get used to it. So this scene is twinned with the earlier scene of Nikolai's death. And that's another one in which there's a transformation from the world that we're accustomed to living in, the ordinary, the mundane, the daily world, um, to another world that we don't understand and that contains within it another kind of being, another kind of existence. For Nikolai, it was a shift into another world that we don't understand. And for this, it's a shift from another world that we don't understand. And there are two um, aspects of these, both these scenes that um, I think are very endearing. And, and in these scenes, Levin and Tolstoy gives over power and responsibility to the women. And we're aware that he, there's some part of Tolstoy that doesn't want to allow women power in the normal world, that he doesn't think they should be educated. He thinks Kitty's role as a wife and mother should satisfy her. But in these times, times of sickness, times of birth, times of death, times in which something transformational takes place, he yields absolutely in humility to the women. The women are in charge of these scenes. They're the only ones who know how to transact these passages, be part of the transaction of these passages. Um, they understand how to use their bodies with these bodies that are in transition. They understand how to use their voices. They understand what's happening in a way that Levin simply cannot. So it's this sense of deep humility 
that um, allows us, it's another aspect of Levin that I find incredibly sympathetic. Um, he's comical in many ways. He's, he's clumsy as we've seen. He um, doesn't understand a lot of things. He's overbearing, he's foolish sometimes, but he isn't somebody, he isn't arrogant in, in the final analysis. He's a man who worships people who understand things that he doesn't understand. And in this case, it's all these women around him. There's a male doctor, but it's Lizaveta Petrovna that takes the child and introduces him to the world. It's Kitty who delivers the child. It's the princess who's standing by. It's Dolly who comforts, who comforts Levin. So this is an entirely a women's um, operation. It's a women's procedure and um, women are in charge of it and they have some intuitive instinctive knowledge that he respects and he gets down on his knees and kisses his wife's hands. So everything about this scene um, shows us the, the mystery, the, um, the astonishment of this passage of, of, of birth, a new life in the world and also Levin's um, deep, um, his readiness to understand that there are other people that can do things that he can't do. So um, we have this as a sort of a balancing scene uh, that, that, moves, um, that moves the narrative along, that, that echoes that scene of Nikolai's death when Kitty took over and Kitty understood how to do it. And you remember that scene of Nikolai's death ends with Kitty under, knowing that, learning that she's pregnant. So he already had twinned those two no notions of death and birth in that very same scene. It was hundreds of pages ago, but he already had this cyclical notion in, in his mind. Now I'm gonna run get my light again, I forgot it. It's getting so light, so late. <laughs> So, um, so that theme of, of birth, which, is, which always echoes death in this book, um, is, is uh, I think, a, a wonderful, oh, it, it opens up our understanding of Levin. It shows him in a new light, in a new way, and it, remember, it, echoes this notion of family. This is what Levin has always wanted. He's old when he, when he um, proposes to Kitty, but the idea of a family has been central to his own needs. And you remember Tolstoy himself didn't grow up with a family. Levin doesn't really either. So he's achieving something that is larger than he is, but it's something that his soul has always yearned for. So then um, we move back to Anna and Vronsky. And one of the scenes, one of the themes in this book is jealousy. And remember we had um, the earlier scene in which Levin acts out the effects of jealousy on his marriage. And we had that very comical scene with him and Veslonsky. And Veslonsky is the world's worst house guest who lames the horse, eats the food, shoots the snipe, um, does everything wrong and flirts with his hostess, with his pregnant hostess. And so Levin challenges him completely out of the blue. He doesn't know how to approach him and he ends up by walking into his bedroom and breaking a stick into small pieces and telling him to get out. <laughs> so, so he really um, mocks himself, mocks his own um, grace as a host, as a diplomat, He's a diplomat, as a man of the world. He's none of those things. He's over, but we are, what we're told, what we're reminded of is the force of jealousy and the power that it has over Levin, who ordinarily is a, a perfectly pleasant, friendly, sympathetic person, but it takes him over in that scene. And that scene is comical. And we end it with watching Veslonsky with his fat calves and his ribbons on his scotch bonnet being sent off in that sort of work carriage off to the to the um, station. But in the second um, 
the, the two thematic um, marriages, Anna and Vronsky, the, not a marriage, but a partnering. So this, the second um, story in this book of Anna and Vronsky in their lives, jealousy has a much darker aspect. It's just as powerful, but it's no longer comical. For Anna, jealousy and for Vronsky, jealousy has um, a terrible power and it's not comical, it's, it's, it seems lethal. So I'm gonna read, um, I'm gonna skim to, but I'm gonna start on page 742 for anyone who wants to follow this along. And this is Anna and Vronsky together and they have these terrible fights, which are kind of brilliant. And, and uh, Tolstoy was, uh, during this period, he was starting to fight with his wife. So you have the feeling that these fights are uh, ones that he might have known and understood very, very intimately. So Vronsky comes home from a dinner and Anna says, so did you have a good time? She asked, coming out to meet him with a guilty and meek expression on her face. I'm gonna turn off my email so I don't, you know, I'm bothered by this. Um, a meek expression on her face. As usual, he replied, understanding at a glance that she was in one of her good moods. He had become used to these changes and was especially glad of it today because he himself was in the best of spirits. What's this I see? That's good, he said, pointing to the trunks in the hallway. Yes, we must leave. I went for a ride and it's so nice that I wanted to go to the country. Nothing's keeping you? It's my only wish. I'll come at once and we'll talk. I only have to change. Send for tea. So then I'm skipping to the next page. And what were you all doing there? Who came, she said. Vronsky named the guests. The dinner was excellent and the boat race and all that was quite nice, but in Moscow, they can't do without the ridicule. Some lady appeared, the queen of Sweden's swimming teacher and demonstrated her art. How? She swam, Anna said, frowning. In some red costume de natation, old, ugly. So when do we leave? What a stupid fantasy. Does she swim in some special way? Anna said without answering. Certainly nothing special. That's what I'm saying. Terribly stupid. So when do you think of leaving? Anna shook her head as if wishing to drive some unpleasant thought away. When? The sooner the better. We won't be ready tomorrow. The day after tomorrow. Yes, no. Oh, wait, the day after tomorrow is Sunday. I must call on Mama, Vronsky said, embarrassed, because as soon as he mentioned his mother, he felt her intent, suspicious look fixed on him. His embarrassment confirmed her suspicions. She flushed and drew away from him. Now it was no longer the Queen of Sweden's teacher that Anna pictured to herself, but Princess Sorokin, who lived on Countess Vronsky's country estate near Moscow. Can't you go tomorrow, she said. No, I can't. The business I'm going for, the warrant and the money won't have come by tomorrow, he replied. In that case, we won't leave at all. But why not? I won't go later, Monday or never. But why, Vronsky said as if in surprise, it makes no sense. For you, it makes no sense because you don't care about me at all. You don't want to understand my life. The only thing that has occupied me here is Hannah. You say it's all pretense. You did say yesterday that I don't love my daughter, but pretend to love this English girl and that it's unnatural. I'd like to know what kind of life can be natural for me here. For a moment, she recovered herself and was horrified at having failed in her intention. But even knowing that she was ruining herself, she could not hold back, could not keep from showing him how wrong he was, could not submit to him. I never said that. I said that I did not sympathize with this sudden love. Since you boast of your directness, why don't you tell the truth? I never boast and I never say anything that isn't true, he said softly, holding back the anger that was surging up in him. It's a great pity if you don't respect. Respect was invented to cover the empty place where love should be. But if you don't love me, it would be better and more honest to say so. No, this is becoming unbearable, Vronsky cried, getting up from his chair. Stopping in front of her, he said slowly, why do you try my patience? He looked as if he could have said many other things, but restrained himself. 
it does have limits. What do you mean by that, she cried, staring with horror at the clear expression of hatred that was on his whole face, especially in his cruel, menacing eyes. I mean, he began, but stopped. I must ask you what you want of me. What can I want? The only thing I can want is that you not abandon me as you're thinking of doing, she said, understanding all that he had left unsaid. But that's not what I want, that's secondary. I want love and there is none, which means it's all over. She went towards the door. Wait, wait, said Vronsky, not smoothing the grim furrow of his brows, but stopping her by the arm. What's the matter? I said we should put off our departure for three days and to that you said I was lying, that I'm dishonest. Yes, and I repeat that a man who reproaches me by saying he has sacrificed everything for me, she said, recalling the words of a previous quarrel, is still worse than a dishonest man. He's a man with no heart. No, patience has its limits, he cried, and quickly let go of her arm. He hates me. It's clear, she thought. And silently, without looking back, she left the room with faltering steps. He loves another woman. That's clearer still, she said, going into her room. I want love and there is none, which means it's all over. She repeated the words she had said, and I must end it. But how, she asked herself and sat down on a chair in front of the mirror. Thoughts of where she could go now, to the aunt who had brought her up, to Dolly or simply abroad alone, and of what he was doing now alone in his study and whether this quarrel was the final one or reconciliation was still possible, and of what all her former Petersburg acquaintances would say about her now, and of how Alexei Alexandrovich would look at it, and many other thoughts came to her mind, but she did not give herself wholeheartedly to these thoughts. In her soul, there was some vague thought which alone interested her, yet she was unable to bring it to consciousness. Having remembered Alexei Alexandrovich once again, she also remembered the time of her illness after giving birth and the feeling that would not leave her then. Why didn't I die? She remembered the words she had said then and the feeling that she had had then. And she suddenly understood what was in her soul. Yes, this was the thought which alone resolved everything. Yes, to die. So this jealousy that Anna feels leads to something very different from what happened to Vyslonsky or to Levin. Anna can't resolve her jealousy. There's no way that Vronsky can persuade her that he's not in love with another woman, even though, even though the Tolstoy gives us no evidence. It's, it's tempting kind of to see Vronsky as a cad, but really there is no evidence in this book that Vronsky is having an affair with anyone else or is tempted by it. What you do feel is that Vronsky, what I feel is that Vronsky is, is starting to lose patience with her, but I don't have the sense that he is tempted by another woman. But you can feel Anna's terror in that she has no protection. She's now thinking of going to the aunt who raised her. And this is the first time <laughs> In this book, when Anna has been at risk for hundreds of pages, this is the first time that we have been given um, the possibility of a refuge for Anna. Remember her, um, her aunt Varvara, the, the one, the sort of louche one, the, um, the one who lives off her rich relatives who was out in the country with her. And she claims to love Anna more than the woman who raised her, her sister, Anna's aunt. She has not come up before, but suddenly she is a possibility for, as a refuge for Anna. She thinks of going to Dolly. We know that that's not gonna work. Dolly has no money and she has a very crowded house. So Anna is really looking at, at um, an, an unimaginable life, uh, living as a poor relative somewhere in somebody's house. Uh, it's, it's not possible for her to imagine it or for us really. So you have this sense of a driving force within Anna, this feeling of jealousy, which is really linked to fear for her own future. Jealousy is, is something that attaches itself to other women, but it's really fear for her life. 
And the resolution for that she keeps returning to the possible revolution is, is death. So death is a theme in this book um, as we, we see it over and over. And um, it's, um, it's a possibility, it's, it's, uh, it's something that we experience in that ravishingly terrible death of Nikolai. It's something that's a possibility during the birth scene for Anna, for Kitty. And now it becomes increasingly present in the story of Anna. And um, so the next passage that I'll read from is page 751. And this is when Tolstoy is very beautiful prose and, and such powerful imagery brings the notion of death closer and closer. So now it's not something that Anna considers in the abstract as a way to end her moral and practical problems. This is something that comes to her in the interior recesses of her mind. And one of the things that Tolstoy does so well is to create a dream state. And as we talked about in this book, emotion is the engine. Emotion is what drives all these characters. Um, and they collide with each other in the grips of emotion. Emotion drives the dialogue. It drives their relationships with each other. Even Karenin, who tries to keep emotion out of his life, he is filled with emotion as well. So, um, and so what Tolstoy does is create these emotional surges that take us over and take the characters over. And, um, persuades us, I mean, certainly persuades me that I am living in the, the mind of this character and I can feel those washes of emotion that surge through me, the character, um, during these passages. And so in this one, he, he creates a state that is like a dream state, but Anna's awake at the beginning of it. So this is the bottom of page 751 and she's She's quarreled with Vronsky again. Each quarrel seems more frightening, more um, dangerous. They come closer and closer to some terrible cliff's edge between them. And um, so in the evening, she heard the sound of his carriage stopping, his ring, his footsteps and conversation with the maid. He believed what he was told, which was that Anna had a headache and didn't want to be disturbed. Of course, she did want him to disturb her, but she, she puts that out as, as, a, as a message, hoping that he will read it correctly, which is, I want you to come and see me. Um, he believed what he was told, did not want to find out anymore, and went to his room. Therefore, it was all over. And death presented itself clear to her clearly and vividly as the only way to restore the love for her in his heart, to punish him and be victorious in the struggle that the evil spirit lodged in her heart was waging with him. Now it made no difference whether they went to Vozbizhensko Vos or not, whether she got the divorce from her husband or not, none of it was necessary. The one thing necessary was to punish him. When she poured herself the usual dose of opium and thought that she had only to drink the whole bottle in order to die, it seemed so easy and simple to her that she began again to enjoy thinking how he would suffer, repent, and love her memory when it was too late. She lay in bed and with her eyes open, looking at the molded cornice of the ceiling and the shadow of a screen extending over part of it in the light of one burnt down candle. And she vividly pictured to herself what he would feel when she was no more and had become only a memory for him. How could I have said those cruel words to her, he would say. How could I have left the room without saying anything? But now she's no more. She's gone from us forever. She's there. Suddenly the shadow of the screen wavered spread over the whole cornice, over the whole ceiling. Other shadows from the other side rushed to meet it. For a moment, the shadows left, but then with renewed swiftness, came over again, wavered, merged, and everything became dark. 
death, she thought. And she was overcome with such terror that for a long time she could not understand where she was. And her trembling hands were unable to find a match and light another candle in place of the one that had burned down and gone out. No, anything, only to live. I do love him. He does love me. It was and it will be no more, she said, feeling tears of joy at the return of light running down her cheeks. And to save herself from her fear, she hastily went to him in the study. He was in the study fast asleep. She went over to him and lighting his face from above, looked at him for a long time. Now, when he was asleep, she loved him so much that looking at him, she could not keep back tears of tenderness. But she knew that if he woke up, he would give her a cold look, conscious of his own rightness. And that before talking to him of her love, she would have to prove to him how guilty he was before. She went back to her room without waking him up. And after a second dose of opium, towards morning, fell into a heavy, incomplete sleep in which she never lost awareness of herself. In the morning, a dreadful nightmare, which had come to her repeatedly, even before her liaison with Vronsky, came to her again and woke her up. A little old Nuzhik with a disheveled beard was doing something, bent over some iron, muttering meaningless French words. And as always in this nightmare, here lay its terror. She felt that this little Nuzhik paid no attention to her, but was doing this dreadful thing with iron over her was doing something dreadful over her and she awoke in a cold sweat. So be aware that at, for a writer, all you writers in the audience know very well, it's hard to write about dreams. It's hard not to bore your reader. It's hard not to um, be unable to convey the feelings of a dream. The dreams are filled with objects and people and sound, but it's the feeling behind them that is so powerful. And it's what Tolstoy does here in this double image. One that happens, one thing that happens while she's awake, this terrifying growth of the darkness, the sweep of the darkness across the ceiling and of a whole room. And then the second dream state, which is actually a nightmare of the music muttering in French. And Tolstoy gives us the feeling of terror and inevitability in both these images. Um, as a writer, I will draw your attention to the details. So we see the molded cornice, we see the shadows of the screen, all those things bring us right into the room, the burned down candlestick, candle in the candlestick. So we can visualize exactly where Anna is. And, and I'm sh I have the feeling that that happened to Tolstoy, that he's lying in a room and sees the shadows sweep across the ceiling in just that way. And he gives us a sense of terror that happens to a human when the light goes in a sudden frightening way. Uh, and you are, you are made aware of the fact that you are not in control, that your life is not necessarily um, in your hands, that darkness may come over you at any moment. So he gives us this terrifying um, foreshadowing right here. Anna's alive. She suddenly feels she's dying in some way she doesn't understand. And then when she realizes that she has control, that she can return to life, she brings herself back to life. She lights a candle. She finds the matches and returns light to her room. And she says, I, I, I want to live. I know he loves me. So it's one of the things that make this book so painful and um, anguishing for, for me, the feeling that Anna wants to live, that she wants something that she keeps losing, that she keeps grasping at and is unable to hold. But the fact that she wants the light, she, she wants Vronsky, she wants to live. Um, but there are forces that she can't control that sweep over her. The dream and because I read this, this book so many times, I lose track of where things um, are in the narrative, but we know this dream because Vronsky had a similar dream to this himself. So that's another sort of terrifying, chilling twinning in the book. And it's twinned so that the two of them have these 
um, echoing dreams that both deliver horror. They both have this same music in the corner muttering French and this telepathic communication between them, which in the which is is wonderful in some ways and suggests that they are they are uh, soulmates, but it it echoes the other telepathic connection and that is with the happy couple that is Kitty and Levin, who had this telepathic communication when he asks her to marry him, when he can read um, the initials that she writes in chalk on the felt tablecloth, he knows exactly what she's writing, so that telepathic communication is a portal to love and connection and the right way to live in the world. This telepathic communication pretends something terrible. It pretends a kind of death. We don't know what it is. That's one of the fears, that, what's one of the terrors that Tolstoy creates in this book. Um, these, this sense of, of um, human, uh, the incapacity of humans to understand these great things of moment, the way the world works, the way death works, the way birth works. So Tolstoy, Levin's humility is echoed in us, that we, we share these fears and these um, moments of uh, ex human experience that we can't explain. We, do, we don't know what happens. We don't know what causes this kind of fear. We don't know what, we can't control the darkness when it sweeps across our lives. So, um, so there's that, and then we're getting closer to <sighs> that last moment. So this is, I wanna read the pa a passage from page six, 760. And this is um, Anna who is in the carriage on the way to the train station. And I want you to remember the day in which Levin goes back to the hotel after he has had this sort of wordless, joyful exchange with Kitty in which they understand that they will get married, but he has to go back the next morning and ask her parents. And we learn from this passage, Bosco, we learn more about um, the domestic life of all these people. They all go to bed about one o'clock in the morning. And when he gets to the house the next morning at 8.30 or nine, no one is up. No one gets up until 10 or so. so Poor Levin, who couldn't sleep all night for excitement, um, has to wait for hours in the morning, um, filled with this exuberance, this joy, this transcendent bliss, because he is being united. He's, he's going to be able to unite his life with Kitty. And remember how his joy, his, his bliss, irradiates the world around him so that he thinks everyone that he sees, the children, the school children in the streets, the pigeons are talking about what's happening to him. The cab drivers all know where he's going. They're all smiling at him. And he's embarrassed to have to choose one out of all the others. And he wants to tell them that he'll choose them next time. He feels this incredible oneness with humanity. And he feels that the whole world is aglow with his sense of joy. Everything, the porters, the cab drivers, everyone. Twinned with that, that sense that Levin's emotion is irradiating the world, we have Anna. And it, the, the dark aspect, the dark guise of emotion is presented here. Anna's despair is transformed into hatred and her feeling of hatred, her feeling of misery and anguish transforms the world as she moves through it. So I'll read you this this passage, 760. Anna got into the carriage in a still worse state than when she had left the house. She's just left her, her Dolly's house from her visit with Dolly and Kitty. To the former torment was now added the feeling of being insulted and cast out, which she clearly felt when she met Kitty. Where to, ma'am? Home? asked Piotr. Yes, home, she said, not even thinking of where she was going. How they looked at me, as if so at something frightful, incomprehensible, and curious. What can he be talking about so ardently with the other one, she thought, looking at two passers-by. Is it really possible to tell someone else how, what one feels? I wanted to tell Dolly, and it's a good thing I didn't. How glad she would be of my unhappiness. 
she would hide it, but her main feeling would be joy that I've been punished for the pleasures she envied me. Kitty, she would be even more glad. How I see right through her. She knows that I was more than usually friendly to her husband. And she's jealous and she hates me and also despises me. In her eyes, I'm an immoral woman. If I were an immoral woman, I could get her husband to fall in love with me if I wanted to. And I did want to. This one's pleased with himself. She thought of a fat red cheeked gentleman who as he drove by in the opposite direction took her for an acquaintance and raised a shiny hat all over his bald, shiny head and then realized he was mistaken. He thought he knew me and he knows me as little as anyone else in the world knows me. I don't know myself. I know my appetites as the French say. Those two want that dirty ice cream. That they know for certain, she thought, looking at two boys who had stopped an ice cream man who was taking the barrel down from his head and wiping his sweaty face with the end of a towel. We all want something sweet, tasty, if not candy, then dirty ice cream. And Kitty's the same, if not Vronsky, then Levin. And she envies me and hates me. We all hate each other. I, Kitty, Kitty, me, that's the truth. Twitkit, Twitkin, coiffeur. Je me fais coiffer par Twitkin, Twitkin. I'll tell him when she comes, she thought and smiled. But at the same moment, she remembered that she now had no one to tell anything funny to. And there isn't anything gay or funny. Everything is vile. The bells ring for vespers and this merchant crosses himself so neatly, as if he's afraid of dropping something. Why these churches, this ringing, and this lie? Only to hide the fact that we all hate each other, like these cabbies who quarrel so spitefully. Yashvin says, he wants to leave me without a shirt and I him. That's the truth. So Anna has become completely engulfed by her sense of misery and she translated, translates it into hatred because Anna hates herself. She cannot find in herself the woman she wants to be. So we remember seeing that shift from Anna, the, the Anna that we saw in the beginning, that generous, kind woman who dropped everything and took an overnight train from Petersburg to Moscow to help her brother in his distress, spends all night talking to a strange woman, Vronsky's mother, um, being generous to her, walks up to her brother, puts her left arm around his neck and kisses him in the, on the train station platform. Um, and is miserable because she's had to leave her son, Seriosha, for the first time in her life. So there was that woman, a woman of great integrity, a woman of gen generosity and deep moral um, sense, of, sense of herself. And she has been transformed in a woman, into a woman who has no place in the world, has lost her son, cannot find a way to be um, received by the church, which she doesn't even necessarily believe in, but it is a hugely important um, scaffolding in the world she lives in. Socially, she is a lost soul, but worst of all, she thinks that she's losing the love of the man that she left everything else for. There is no place for her. She can't find a place to stand. She can't find a reason to respect herself. She can't find a reason to love herself anymore. And this feeling of self-hatred and despair translates into a feeling of hatred that fills the world that she sees. Everyone she sees is acting out the feelings that she has. So another aspect of Tolstoy's extraordinary ability to deliver these emotional surges that are so powerful, that drive this book and that engage us. Um, and I will read you the end of this section just because it is such an important passage. 767. As she was speaking with the attendant, the coachman, Michaela, red-cheeked, cheerful, 
and smart blue jacket with a watch chain, obviously proud of having fulfilled his errand so well, came up to her and handed her a note. She opened it and her heart sank even before she read it. I'm very sorry the note did not find me. I'll be back at 10, Vronsky wrote in a careless hand. So, I expected that, she said to herself with a spiteful smile. Very well, you may go home, she said softly, addressing Michaela. She spoke softly because the quick beating of her heart interfered with her breathing. No, I won't let you torment me, she thought, addressing her threat not to him, not to herself, but to the one who made her suffer. And she walked along the platform past the station house. Two maids who were pacing the platform bent their heads back, looking at her and voicing their thoughts about her clothes. The real thing, they said, of the lace she was wearing. The young men would not leave her alone. They passed by again, peering into her face, laughing and shouting something in unnatural voices. The station master, as he passed by, asked whether she would be getting on the train. A boy selling class could not take his eyes off her. My God, where to go, she thought, walking further and further down the platform. At the end of it, she stopped. Some ladies and children who were laughing and talking loudly as they met a gentleman in spectacles fell silent and looked her over as she went past them. She quickened her pace and walked away from them to the edge of the platform. A goods train was coming. The platform shook and it seemed to her that she was on the train again. And suddenly, remembering the man who was run over the day she first met Vronsky, she realized what she must do. With a quick, light step, she went down the stairs that led from the water pump to the rails and stopped close to the, and stopped close to the passing train. She looked at the bottoms of the carriages, at the bolts and chains and big cast iron wheels of the first carriage wrote slowly rolling by and tried to estimate by eye the midpoint between the front and back wheels and the moment when the middle would be in front of her. There, she said to herself, staring into the shadows of the carriage at the sand mixed with coal poured between the sleepers. There, right in the middle, and I'll punish him and be rid of everybody and of myself. She wanted to fall under the first carriage, the midpoint of which had drawn Eve even with her. But the red bag, which she started taking off her arm, delayed her, and it was too late. The midpoint went by. She had to wait for the next carriage. A feeling seized her, similar to what she had experienced when preparing to go into the water for a swim, and she crossed herself. The habitual gesture of making the sign of the cross called up in her soul a whole series of memories from childhood and girlhood. And suddenly the darkness that covered everything for her broke and life rose up before her momentarily with all its bright past joys. Yet she did not take her eyes from the wheels of the approaching second carriage. And just at the moment when the midpoint between the two wheels came even with her, she threw the red bag aside and drawing her head down between her shoulders, fell in her hands under the carriage. And with a light movement, as if preparing to get up again at once, sank to her knees. And in that same instant, she was horrified at what she was doing. Where am I? What am I doing? Why? She wanted to rise, to throw herself back, but something huge and implacable pushed at her head and dragged over her. Lord, Forgive me everything, she said, feeling the impossibility of any struggle. But Mujik, muttering to himself, was working over some iron. And the candle, by the light of which she had been reading that book, filled with anxieties, deceptions, grief, and evil, flared up brighter than ever, lit up for her all that had once been in darkness, sputtered, grew dim, and went out forever. So I always cry. I always cry. It's so powerful. Anna is someone who has so much passion, so much love in her soul, so many resources. 
um, Tolstoy makes very sure that we uh, find her a character that we can admire. I know people, there are people who don't, but I find her a, a wonderfully rich um, and sympathetic character who becomes trapped. Um, and she's trapped by that very thing that drives the whole book, which is passion. Every character feels passion. We are, we understand that Tolstoy finds passion to be essential to human life. And it's Anna whose passion destroys her. So, um, so there we have the end of our wonderful, beautiful, uh, doomed Anna Karenina. I feel as if we should have a moment of silence. Um, but because we can't, you can have silence tonight before you go to sleep. Um, so I want to tell you some of the autobiographical material that is present in this book. And um, so we know that Levin often stands in for Tolstoy. And um, there are lots of things in this book that connect Levin and Tolstoy. One of the, the beginnings of this book um, takes place in, 19, in 1870. Um, Tolstoy was writing a, an essay on the woman, the woman question, which is about women's education and women's role in society, which was important at that time. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> um, and, he, and he thought of, at that time in 1870 about writing a, a book about adultery. So it's a question um, that has arisen for him. He's had an illegitimate child. His father had an illegitimate child. His brother, Nikolai uh, Dmitri, lived with a woman, had illegitimate children. So um, adultery is a, very present in his life. There were, as we know, there were lots of adulterous affairs in um, the social world that he was part of. So it's, but he is a man that believes in morality and integrity and honor. So it's a, it's a moral, um, it's a moral issue for him. So in 1872, uh, two years later, this is a quote from the Rosamund Bartlett um, uh, biography, and I recommend it if, if you, anyone wants to read more about him, of Tolstoy. On a dark, cold evening in January, 1872, a 35-year-old woman called Anna Pirogova arrived at the Yasenki station just down the road from Yasnaya Polyana with a bundle co containing a change of underwear. After crossing herself, she threw herself under goods train number 77. Anna was a distant cousin of Tolstoy's wife, Sonia. She had become the housekeeper and the lover of his friend and neighbor, Alexander Bibikov, who was then in his early 50s. He had told Anna that he was, I think he's a widower, it's not said, but he must be. He had told Anna that he planned to marry his son's governess, who was an attractive German girl. She had sent him a note accusing him of being her murderer before she took her own life. Um, and this is one of the first railway, railway suicides of which there were many afterwards. Tolstoy himself despised the railroad, which he thought was destroying human, uh, Russian life. Of course, he used it himself, it was so convenient, but he did have the sense that it was an industrial intrusion into the landscape, which, which he was right about. And I wonder about that music who's working over something that's iron. I wonder if that iron refers to the, to the iron horse, the, the railroad. So you have that, um, that his interest in adultery and then you have this spectacular suicide. And it was just down the road from Yasnaya Polyana and Tolstoy as a local landowner went down and saw the body and was very, moved by this young woman who had taken her own life. Um, but there was more, there's a greater connection to, and a more intimate connection between this story and Tolstoy. Tolstoy had a sister, one sister, Maria, called Masha, and she had married a distant cousin, Valerian Petrovich Tolstoy. He was a dull bureaucrat, very much like Karenine, um, but she had several children with him and she, in order to get away from this unhappy marriage, she traveled a lot. Remember how 
Europe is the other destination. It's the way to get away from Russia in real life. So she is at the spa in Aix-les-Bains in 1861, where she meets a Swedish Viscount, Hector Victor de Klein. She has an affair with him, he's unmarried. And she spends two winters with him in Algier. Talk about getting away, that Algier is really far away. Um, and that's where they go for their, this adulterous, um, it's not just a vacation, the whole winter they spend. And then she's pregnant, gets pregnant with his daughter. Um, now the biography doesn't give me the date, so I don't know exactly what the dates are, but what happens is she has, she has this child and she writes to both of her brothers, Sergei, um, Sergei and, and Leo, Lev, that she has had this illegitimate child. Both of them have illegitimate, illegitimate children and they are sympathetic. And in 1864, Tolstoy goes to Valerian and he asks Valerian if he will give, if he will agree to the divorce. So all of a sudden we see that passage with Steva going to Karenine and it, it suddenly echoes with um, lived experience from Tolstoy. Um, and Valerian says at first that he will give permission, but Masha is too timid to push it through. It is a huge deal in Russia at that time, getting a divorce. The church was opposed to it. You can only do it with permission from the bishop. You have to prove adultery. Remember, we learned that from the scene in the lawyer's office. Um, it's a mortifying experience. Um, everyone is ashamed. And so Masha does not push this through, although it's Leo Tolstoy himself who is trying to arrange this. So we have all this, um, uh, these passages in the book in which to uh, Lev is supposed to be carrying out doing business on the, on the part of his sister. And that's what's going on. He's trying to get the divorce. He's trying to get the bishop to agree. He's trying to get Karenin to agree to the divorce. Um, so Masha is scared to set things in motion, even though Valerian at first agrees to. Then he writes her a, an angry, threatening letter saying that the divorce would ruin his career and that she mustn't do it. And so she loses, she, she gets cold feet. She loses her, her um, loses her nerve. So um, in the meantime, the Viscount, whose family does not want him to marry a divorced Russian woman with four children and no money. So the Viscount meets a rich aristocratic Swedish woman and he abandons Masha in Europe. So she is mired in debt. She is a scarlet woman. She's adulterous. She has an illegitimate child and her situation is dire. And she writes in 1876, it's just while Tolstoy is writing the book, she writes him a letter and from, she's in Heidelberg now. She says, I'm su in such an appalling moral state. Loneliness is affecting me so dreadfully with the constant worry which hangs over me like the sword of Damocles in which I think about day and night that I sometimes get frightened. Thoughts of suicide have begun to hound me. I mean, really hound me and so relentlessly that it's become a kind of illness or madness. So Tolstoy who loves Masha and is writing back to her and he is also kind of a depressive as well. So, and he has ha had suicidal feelings to the extent to which he wouldn't go hunting with a gun because he was afraid he would shoot himself. And he hides ropes from himself so that he won't hang himself. So, he understands exactly what Masha is talking about. He feels this terror that is enveloping her. He feels it in himself. And he writes this into the book. And Masha finally returns to Russia um, and Valerian died. Again, I don't have exactly have the dates, but this did not resolve the situation because she has this illegitimate child. And she leaves her child, her daughter, who is now 13 in Switzerland. I don't know what happens after that. I don't know if the child lives the rest of her life in Switzerland, but um, she does not have the nerve to bring this illegitimate child back to Russia. Um, she couldn't do it because she would be, an, she was afraid that she would be an outcast like Anna. And she wrote to Tolstoy that she did not know a single woman from their background 
who had the courage to acknowledge that she had an illegitimate child. And now I want you to remember all the children in these households that are wards or being raised by so-and-so. And I think, and in War and Peace, there are lots of them. So there's this kind of gray genealogical area in which children were raised in other households without questions being asked because every, not everybody, but there were illegitimate children that were, that were sort of um, raised as, as undetermined married, uh, members of the family. But she does not have the nerve to do this since she is now debt ridden and a widow. Um, and in Tolstoy's family, remember, he had a son with a, a, the wife of a mujik and everyone knew that was his son and he was a coachman. So there were children who were acknowledged and children who were not acknowledged, but it is a great social crime to do this. And so Masha could not um, gather the courage to bring her daughter back. And eventually she became a nun. That was her response. She did not commit suicide, but she gave up her life to God because she couldn't resolve this. So Tolstoy himself, as he was writing this book, was going through this passionate um, and deeply empathetic uh, situation with his own sister. And, and Masha is reading Anna Karenina as it's coming out in the magazine. So she is both generating the content and also reading this story about herself in some ways. And she writes a letter about it. Um, and she says, um, if all those Anna Kareninas knew what awaited them, how they would run from ephemeral pleasures, which are not and cannot be pleasures, because nothing that is unlawful can ever constitute happiness. So that's also part of Tolstoy's feeling that um, Anna has done something that's irrevocable in abandoning her son and her husband. And so there is no lawful happiness for her afterwards. But at the same time, there's another, there's another moment in Tolstoy's life, which he wrote about later. And so we know it was important to him. His aunt, or maybe she's a uh, great a cousin or something, um, but a relative of his who was a great favorite, her name was Antoinette. And he told her as a young man about, or a man in his 30s or 40s, he told her about a man who ha whose wife had left him and she, for, for a lover. And Tolstoy said very unfeelingly, well, he must be glad to get rid of her, a wife like that. And Antoinette said, no, that's not how to think about this woman. You forgive her. You are generous to her. You don't understand what she's feeling. You're generous to her. And he wrote about this saying how important her response was. And that feeling of compassion for people who do things that are in some ways unforgivable, even the worst things that happen in this book, Vronsky kicking a horse, Karen um, turning away Anna, Tolstoy finds a way to understand them and sympathize with these characters. And it fills this book with generosity. So it's a book about people gripped by passion, unable to control themselves, careening through the world, um, creating havoc. But Tolstoy allows us and encourages us to give them a sense of compassion. So, okay. That's my view of this book. It, it is one of the, so we have one more part to go through, but, but this, this ending with Anna is, is so central and so important. It feels for me in some ways, the book is complete. The arc of the narrative is complete here. But I just want to, I want to draw your attention to um, the way Tolstoy fills these lives with not just incident, but intellectual components. So we've talked about the boring and confusing Zemsfo meeting, the boring and confusing philosophical arguments, the arguments about the music and agriculture. All those things are, I, as I've said, I think Tolstoy wants us to feel bored and confused by them, but they give Levin in particular, or this conversation about the architecture of the new hospital, they give texture to these people's lives 
and they give them a richness that they wouldn't have if these were simply stories about love. These were simply love stories about how Kitty and Levin got together, how Anna and Bronsky couldn't manage it. These people have much more complicated um, intellectual lives than just those romantic um, components. So we're asked to understand the fact that Levin is a sort of obsessive in his interests and um, Vronsky's military interests. There, there are all sorts of things that we needn't participate in, but we can recognize as important in other people's lives. And then this great, great passionate arc of both these two couples going in opposite directions that Tolstoy asks, asks us to engage with and to sympathize with and to live with them. So I feel as, I always feel as if I have lived the lives of these four characters, Kitty and Levin and Anna and Bronsky at the end of this book. So um, the author of the biography, I, I, it's in the um, introduction to this course. So I've, I've put a list of books that I recommend. Um, the, this particular biography is, I mean, the only biography I recommend is by Rosamund Bartlett. And it's called Tolstoy, and this is what it looks like. There he is. Um, so we'll talk about the epigraph for the for the net on the next when we really get to the end of the book. I want you all to consider it. It's very confusing, and I've heard different. Um, I have different views of it, but I and I want you to um, to think about it. I'd love to hear your thoughts. People have written lots and lots of different interpretations. There are many ways to interpret it. Um, so I, I'm going to wait until we finish that. Uh, so Susan Nordma Nordmark, Nordmark asks, what was the status of these children? So, well, Varenka it is, a is a child whose um, origin is, is obscure. And she's brought up by Madame Stahl, who was married and is a member of the social circle, the higher elevated social circles. And so Varenka, when there's a question of her marrying Sergei, um, Levin's brother, she, she, because she was raised in the proper circles and she can, she's, uh, she can play the piano beautifully, she's, she's, um, she's been raised like a person of, of good breeding. She could marry anyone. And, and uh, one of the good things about Varenka is she doesn't have a big family. Not, nobody wants a woman to bring a big family with her, so she is, she's alone except for Madame Stahl. So she's, she, but we are given to understand that there is something slightly fuzzy about her origins. So it just depends. And then here's Hannah, who is Anna's English ward. She's going to raise that girl. She was planning to raise that girl to be socially elevated, um, well brought up, to speak well, to play the piano. So it's, as I say, it's kind of a, it's a murky, um, area. Um, so what else? Oh yes, Tolstoy. Tolstoy died at a railroad station. Thank you, Grace. Um, so Anna mentions this when she says when, before she commits suicide, she she thinks that she she doesn't know where to go. She may go to the Countess's estate. And she thinks that she will go to the next station on the line. So that notion of escape is in Tolstoy's mind in 1875. And that's what he did in when, whenever he died, 186 or something like, uh, 196 or something like that. That's what he did to get away from his life, which he felt was overwhelming to him. He goes, gets on the train and goes to the next station down the line, which is where he died. So there is this weird foreshadowing of, Tolstoy's own death, not that he committed suicide, but um, he does connect his this sense, sense of escape and final refuge with the train, even though it was something that he deplored. So, okay, any anyone want to speak up? Let's hear some voices. Donald? Uh, yeah, so, uh... It's, it's really hard to talk about Anna after, after in, in any kind of critical way after that really tragic ending that you read so beautifully. Uh, when I think about the, the biographical examples you gave, 
Uh, you had the one woman who was truly abandoned who committed suicide, you understand that. You have the sister who was abandoned and who didn't commit suicide. And you had Anna who was fighting about whether to leave for the country on Sunday versus Monday, uh, and who hasn't been betrayed by Bronsky, you know, well, despite the fact that it's in her mind. Uh, well, you know, e even the question of the divorce, uh, and, 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 and it seems clear that it's not going to happen thanks to the, the wonderful Bezubov and, and, his, uh, and his, his advice, another great little minor character that got added. Uh, but you know, Steve is trying to spin it as best he can. It's not over. And it doesn't seem like Anna is despairing because now it's really over. Uh, so it, it's kind of a descent into madness. And, and, and that, that, that last 10, 15 pages where she's riding through the streets and you know, the stream of consciousness, it's really something out of the, it's 20th century literature, it's brilliant. Uh, you know, you can sort of see what's happening with her mind, you know, that she's just not rational and, and, and her motives are kind of dark, you know, she's kind of punishing Bronsky, well, you know, wait, now he'll really be sorry. And in fact, she's right. Uh, so she kind of, it, it was sort of a vicious thing that she did. So I'm just, you know, uh, I'm having trouble sometimes sympathizing with her. So does anyone want to respond to that? Anyone have a want to defend Anna? Well, I I found those last fifteen or twenty pages uh, just extraordinarily uh, emotional, and um, the fact that uh, the apotheosis of velocity, intensity, and empathy goes from one chapter to another without without let up. And it just, uh, it's that train coming down the tracks and you just are so involved with her torment. Uh, I just thought it was, I mean, as, as you were saying, Don, I mean, it is, the stream of consciousness is so modern. The fact that he was able to sustain that was really uh, just a, worth the whole book for me. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, matter. go ahead. I want to ask a question um, that actually other people have asked on the thread, which just has to do with the role of opium and how it gets introduced pretty late. And then I also hope you'll have a chance to answer Bobby Ann's uh, the point that Bobby Ann made because I think it's fascinating. But I'll let her ask that. Let me find out. Um, but anyway, but just about the opium and nearing the end there. Yeah. So I, I talked about this a little bit last time. It, opium was. I won't say widely used, but it was it was certainly available, and um, society women took uh, special cough syrups and all sorts of elixirs that were meant to lift their spirits or put them to sleep. Men too, but I mean it was a lot of it. There were sort of advertisements at Scribner's mag magazine, things like that, um, saying this lifts my spirits or this puts me to sleep. And and um, because I wrote Cost, which is a book about heroin addiction, I did a lot of research into heroin and its origins, and it was, it was, um, it was completely um, legal. And Bayer, the German company, the German pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company, Bayer, um, developed heroin, which is morphine with two additives, um, and named it heroin because it was such a great painkiller and it was legal for de several decades. So it wasn't, um, it was certainly something that, Anna says, well, I don't take it that often. So she knows, she knows it's something she shouldn't be taking, but I don't think it's illegal. And I think it's, you know, it's a sleep aid. So it's, it's definitely dark. It's a dark presence. And mm -hmm. Princess Barbara accuses her of that. So we know that she shouldn't be doing it, but I don't think it's, it's she's, not a, she's not a- I'm wondering, are we meant to see her as an addict? Probably not. She's, I think it's, I think it's more evidence of what her state is than the cause of it. Like her disintegrating personality. No, she, yeah, she, she can't sleep. She says, I, she, she says, I don't take it unless you're away. And then she says, well, sometimes I do. So she, it sounds as though she's becoming dependent on it. In modern, in modern psychological parlance, um, uh, people would look at, at Anna and think, oh, she probably had post to severe postpartum depression, which contributed to her paranoia and her depression and her uh, doubts about him and her 
dislike of the child. I mean, there are all sorts of things that could have come out of that. I also, I, you know, Don, you didn't find Anna a sympathetic character. I find her an extremely sympathetic character. She's a woman who's um, caught in a trap and she's trying desperately to hold on. And um, so I think it's, it's just a tragedy of where she lived and what society was like that drove her to kill herself. I think one of the things that also happened, I mean, I do think that opium and morphine, the two things that she does do and although not all the time, may be a contributing factor, but I, I sort of, I, I'd like you to comment um, if, you, if you would, Roxana, on part of this is, um, she, of course she's afraid, she's jealous, she's afraid Vronsky would leave her, but is Vronsky the man that she really loves? Um, it, I, I don't hear in the, in the dialogue, you know, this is a man that I, I've sacrificed everything for, absolutely. Uh, but he, with his military background, with his inability to relate to her son, with their communication gap, and there are a few times this phrase happens of then when they fight, they, they say the next morning, the feeling of reconciliation was complete. I assume they had great sex that night, but I'm not sure that led to a sustaining relationship. And how disappointed was she in Vronsky, his emphasis on a military life? Yes, he, he was, he had not done nothing terrible in terms of her, but it, he did not meet her passion. So it's a good question. Um, and one of the, the passages I read about the fight ends with, um, <clears throat> on 745 at the bottom of that, Vronsky implored her to calm herself and assured her that there was not the shadow of a reason for her jealousy, that he had never stopped and would never stop loving her, that he loved her more than ever. Anna, why torment yourself and me like this? He said, kissing her hands. There was tenderness in his face now, and it seemed to her that she heard the sound of tears in his voice and felt their moisture on her hand. And instantly, Anna's desperate jealousy changed to a desperate, passionate tenderness. She embraced him and covered his head and neck and hands with kisses. So Tolstoy wants us to feel this passionate current that is still between them. I, and Bobby Ann says um, Kitty was, was pregnant for a year. It's one of the things that are these discrepancies. As I say, there was never an editor who received the entire manuscript of the book and went through it and said, is Vronsky rich or not? Is, when did Kitty get pregnant? Come on. So there, there are these factual discrepancies. Um, about Vronsky, as I say, I find him to be the least coherent of all the characters. Um, he is one person when we first meet him, he seems to be another person, slightly the military man, the, the, the artist is somebody who's there to, to allow Tolstoy to talk about art and to allow us to think about what Mikhailova's life is like. But Vronsky doesn't really have a role there. And I, I can't believe that that military man would actually take up painting and throw his stole over his shoulder like that. Um, so he's, he's the one person in the book that doesn't, isn't completely coherent for me. Um, and, and I have often wondered, for example, what they talked about after they became lovers, because it seems as though the whole time leading up to her capitulation, they're talking about whether or not he's, she says, no, he says, would you, she says, no, but she's fascinated. He says, would you, she says, not really, not yet. No, you know, that's the, that's the conversation. But, and after that, um, what did they talk about before she leaves Karen? Aine? I guess it's just all sex. Um, it does, it, we do get a sense of the two of them leading a real life when they're at Vostage, no, I'm not gonna get it. They're at their country house, Vostage Vensko. Um, when, when they're talking about the hospital and the architecture and the horses, I mean, it seems as though the two of them have a real partnership. They uh, enjoy talking about things together. 
Um, and then in the carriage at the end, she sees a funny shop sign and she's gonna tell him about it. And then she realizes she has no one to tell things to. So you do get a sense of intimacy, but I don't, um, I don't quite understand Vronsky. Roxana, is there any uh, conjecture about Vronsky being based on a real person? Um, there is another, there is another person in in this uh, in Tolstoy's life who is somebody he knew, who it's a really complicated uh, situation. There's several there's several adulterous couples in the biography that are named and people who had a woman who leaves her husband and her child um, for a Vronsky like character. So um, there's speculation, but but you know I don't I don't think he had one person in mind where it's where. It, Steva, for example, seems absolutely knowable. I have the sense that I know Steva, I know what he would do in any situation. He seems completely consistent. Vronsky, less so. So I, I don't know that he was based on a, on a particular person. He seems like the, the guy, the, the handsome, dashing lover. But who that ever that might be, is it's malleable. Well, he was a real creation. I think so, yeah. One of the characteristics that is repeated really four or five times is the fact that Vronsky does not lie. And even Anna says it. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me a, a true label that Tolstoy pinned on him. I agree with you that I don't feel him in the three dimensions, but I just want to bring that to bear. Absolutely. I mean, as I, we've, we've talked about this before, it's kind of tempting to think of Vronsky as a, a cad, a bounder, but he really isn't. He's, I mean, except, except for seducing a married woman, which doesn't seem to be something that's outside the pale in his social circles. Um, but he does everything else honorably. When she says, I'm pregnant, he says, then we'll run away together. That's, you know, that's what I will, I will offer you my protection. And he, he doesn't lie. And he's, he's very honorable. It's Anna who's going mad at the, at the end. He's not lying to her. He's not deceiving her. But she is convinced that he is because her life, she can't control her life. She can't make her life work. He's, he seems to think his life can go on the way it always was, uh, except, for the, uh, except for his regiment or whatever it is, which he obviously has had to step down from. But he still goes off to the stables and goes off to the dinners and continues his life as it always was. So it's and, interesting. Oh, go, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, he doesn't need to be anybody. There's no reason why he should have any characteristics at all beyond the ones he does. He's not a, he's not a mover of the, of the narrative. It's true. It's true. But, um, and also what you say is really interesting because uh, you can see that these that the Russian social life is set up. It's quite gender separate. So that when Steva goes to the restaurant, it's all men. When he goes to a dinner party, it's all men. Um, when he goes to visit somebody, it's men and women. But there's a lot of there's a lot of separation. So that Vronsky, you you feel that he is just doing what the other husbands do. He's going to these dinners with the other husbands. He's going to the club, which is all male. Um, and that's normal for him. And he expects Anna to carry on the way a wife would. And he, he, doesn't, he doesn't seem able to understand that she has been torn away from the life that she would lead otherwise. Roxana, I had a question about um, Anna's marriage. And I sent it, I had it all annotated and sent it to the library and it got lost or something. Oh, sorry. Uh, that, Steva says at one point to Anna, the difference in your marriage or, or your ages was 20 years and yet you married him anyway. And then I, I, there's another passage where um, we learn that uh, Anna was brought up by her provincial aunt and the word provincial is used, who introduced her to uh, Karenine. And, um, and then in that same passage, we find out that someone told him that Anna had been compromised by him and that he had to marry her. Right, yeah. And, yeah. and, there, and then there's another passage and I had these all written out in my long question. But um, at that point, 
maybe is there a way in which Karenine felt that he had been generous? He said to Anna, you can continue your, your marriage, just don't bring Vronsky into the home. Um, but, but, but Anna is so beautiful and so charming. Why was there not other suitors for her? Does it have to do with the word provincial? Did she not come out in society where she would have had the okay. attentions of other men? <coughs> anyway, I hope my question turns up because I have all these passages annotated. No, I, I know all those passages. You're, and it's a really good point to raise. And I would suggest that it's, um, it's, 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 it's incomprehensible. She is so beautiful. She is so accomplished. You would think that she would have hordes of, of suitors. She is provincial, but so is her, her aunt Barbara is part of the part of society in Moscow and in Petersburg. So it's clearly not something that's, it's not a social circle that she can't um, leave. She's, she's part of the elevated circles. Um, my, so um, Tolstoy wrote five drafts of this book. So I don't know whether he wrote five drafts of each section or not, but um, as I say, the idea of the book changed for him. He was originally going to write about a, a woman who was older and not and rather vulgar and coarse. And so you could sense it just in the description that it wasn't somebody that he had much sympathy for. It was gonna be about adultery. It was about a woman who ruined herself and just the description made her sound like someone we wouldn't sympathize with. As he wrote it, um, he became more engaged by Anna. She became beautiful, she became accomplished. And my sense is that, that that passage about her marriage to Karenine, which comes very late in the book, was um, him thinking, okay, I have, to I have to explain this because why would she have married him? I know, compromise, that will do it. So it's not very, it's not very um, satisfactory. I completely agree with you. But it sort of makes uh, her husband a little more sympathetic. I mean, he was, he was orphaned and, and the word compromised is used. He was yeah. forced to marry Anna yeah. uh, by this aunt, yes. Yeah, so, and that could happen very, it was, it was something very slight. I mean, if the two of them went off on a sleigh ride at, at an after, for an afternoon without a chaperone, that could be um, considered compromising for Anna. And so, it, it, and the man would have no say in it at all. I mean, if the, the women, if the social circle all accuses him of this, then he must do the honorable thing. So yeah, although we don't, I don't have much sympathy for Karen in, in being forced to marry Anna Karenina. She's, she's such a, she's such a catch. <laughs> but yes, it's, it's confusing and you, you find out about it very late in the book and it's, it's not very satisfying. Roxana, what about the fact that at the end, it's Karenin who takes the baby? Well, the baby is his. Um, we haven't gotten there yet, but um, okay. the baby is legally his. Yeah. That's, that's why Vronsky is so upset. Remember when Vronsky talks to Dolly and says, please get Anna to get a divorce. I, all of our ch future children will be Karenines by law mm -hmm. unless, she gets, unless she gets divorced and, and, and we can marry. So that's one of the enormous ironies of this book that, that the child of passion reverts to the staid, um, cold husband. Her fate. The child is left to her fate, just as Anna was. Um, I feel as though this whole book has been a very long train ride. And the last bit between Anne and Vronsky for me was excruciating. The only thing that could keep me going was feeling I had to honor the pages themselves because I was already seven some odd pages in. And I realized it, it was a long, it's been a long journey. It's a very long journey and, and it sort of incorporates everything. As I say, it, it took Tulsa like four years he was thinking about these issues, agriculture, Russian politics, um, the idea of family. So all of these things were part of his own life. And yeah. he uses this book as a kind of spotlight to explore these different issues, but it's driven by these, 
the, the engines of these two couples who yeah. are making arcs through the firmament. Yeah, incredible. Huh. Uh, Roxana? Yeah, hi, Joan. Hi. Um, did things not really change in Russia until the revolution for this kind of societal, I mean, for women, for uh, this kind of societal um, hindrances and traps? Um, so there are lots of aspects to, to this. I mean, um, the question of women getting educated was already being discussed in the 1870s. They weren't allowed to go to university at that point, um, but that would change. Donald can probably tell you more about the changing in Russian society. But you know, in this country, Edith Horton, um, Lily Bart was, was caught in similar societal traps. Mm -hmm. Um, the question of divorce is really interesting, and, and divorce was changing from 1861 when Masha had her affair with the, with the Swede, till 18, between that and 1876 when uh, laws were changed. But there were very few divorces given, granted in Russia, and you had to prove all sorts of things. You had to prove adultery, you had to get the bishop to agree, and you, you, I think they were mutually exclusive. You, if you proved adultery, you couldn't prove that the marriage had not been consummated or the marriage didn't ex really exist, but the bishop wouldn't give you a divorce unless there was some way to prove it didn't, you know, it wasn't a real marriage. Um, interestingly, there was something like 700 marriages in all of Russia in the preceding 10 years. Two of those were in Tolstoy's family. So, <laughs> It was, it was actually Sonia, Sonia's family, her, her family's wife's. Um, but uh, so divorce was very, very difficult to get. And as we could see, people had other arrangements. I mean, they would have affairs, but stay married, which was uh, certainly uh, the way European society conducted itself for centuries. Um, and as to when it changed, I, I am not an expert about the Russian Revolution. I can't, I can't. No. Um, but, but, you know, Tolstoy gives Anna an intellectual life. She is a writer. She writes a whole book that the publisher says is brilliant and extraordinary. So he is reminding us that she is a woman with a great deal to offer to the world. Um, even though she's not allowed to go to university, she has, she has this. So I'm just scanning this to see if there are any other questions. Uh, is, so somebody asks why Levin had never met Anna. He just never had. I mean, uh, Anna lives in Petersburg and Moscow lives outside, uh, Levin lives outside Moscow. Um, but also remember how male oriented this society is so that unless, and Levin doesn't go to balls and Anna isn't in Moscow. So uh, you can see why they might not have ever met. Um, I have a, a comment on Anna's last uh, uh, words or in interior thoughts. Like, she, um, she may be mad and she may be uh, affected by morphine, but she, she vacillates as kind of to be or not to be. And it almost appeared to me that at one point she it, it just, she had to take some action and she, she was debating suicide, but she hadn't really decided it. But at some point she just had to act and she threw herself under the train. And as soon as she, she did that, she wondered why she was there under the train. And and tried to get back out, but of course it was, it was too late. And it seemed to me that, um, I'm not saying it's rational or ordinary, but it's not so extraordinary. It's not necessarily madness. Uh, and there often is you know, not much space between, between doing A and doing B. And uh, luckily what she decided to do was irrevocable. She couldn't undo it. Usually one can, or can mitigate it, or take you know some other compensating steps. So I, I you know, I, 
it, you know, it makes it makes her that much more empathetic, I think, because um, this is not you know, written in stone and it's not necessarily destiny, but it happened. Yeah, I think vacillation is, is a great a point to, to uh, remind everyone of. And, and for those of you who are talking about morphine and opium, she's not, she's not an addict who commits suicide because she's undone by drugs. That's not the situation. She is undone by her situation. She takes drugs to get to sleep, but she, she doesn't take drugs all day long. She's not always out for the next hit. That's not what makes her commit suicide. It is the despair that is what's making her take the drugs. And as a psychologist will tell you, people commit suicide when they can no longer bear to wake up in the morning. And what confronts them is too awful to endure an, a, another day. And what's happening to Anna is, um, as, as we're all saying, she, she looks from one direction to the other. She, will she do, can she do this? Will this solve it? What if she goes to the countess, countess's estate? That's not going to work. What if she goes to Dolly's? It's not going to work. What if she takes the train to the next station? What, what will wait for her there? There is no place for Anna to go. She is, she is driven to despair. Um, and it's, it's true, she, she, she doesn't commit suicide with, she doesn't have this intention the whole time, but she, her choices are narrowing. We just see that over and over. And we see the way she thinks of death. Death keeps coming back into her mind. She sees the shadows spill across the ceiling and it means death to her. Um, so Tolstoy is, is revealing to us the, sh the passage in her mind and her consciousness towards this inevitable ending. Um, and as Donald said, it's a, it's a tour de force that, that those last pages of, of very, very modern stream of consciousness um, recording of someone's thoughts who who is driven nearly to madness. And, and it's Tolstoy who does that. It's Tolstoy who can enter into the mind of someone who is driven towards such despair. And um, I, I, he, it's, an, it's an extraordinary capacity for him. And he does it throughout the book. He goes into the mind of the dog. He goes into the mind of, of Steva, who, the adulterous husband. Everyone that he enters into um, he enters into completely with such a sense of understanding and empathy. And for me, this ending, which is um, a spiral of despair, is incredibly powerful. It, it, it completely persuades me that this is, this is how Anna uh, descends into her final, that, that final moment. She has no, she has no option. And he persuades me of that. So I'd like I, to... yeah, I feel nothing but sympathy for her. Yeah, sorry. Um, the thing that I'm struck by is, of course, uh, as you, um, I think you pointed out the there's a kind of, um, you know, uh, the, the birth of Levin's child and then the death of Anna and going into the mind of Levin and Anna, he's, Tolstoy spends a lot of time, just a lot of time in Levin's mind during this long birth where he just doesn't understand what's happening. And it's, he's in this almost dream state of fear and confusion. And the other thing, but twinned the this, long period with Anna and the scene where she contemplates all of the calculating that she makes. It's not some kind of throwing herself. She's calculating what to do is to me extraordinary. And then she ends up under the train. The thing is hitting her head and she's having the last thoughts of she he he suggests that possibly she's having the in her last thought she's thinking oh life maybe i don't need to do this i like being alive but now it's too late but she, i don't think i've ever heard 
I don't think I've ever seen any writer respect the, the existence, the inner existence of a person committing suicide toward and through that very last moment. Mm. I don't think I've ever seen such a thing. It's extraordinary to me. And it's really a scene that for me creates respect. For Tolstoy or for Anna? For Anna. Yeah. That's a really good point. I, I agree with you. I don't, I can't think of another writer who does that too. It, and it seems like an act of courage for him to do that. Re oh, Rexana? Yes. Uh, to that, I wanted to, um, there's a quotation I just wanted to read because I think it really, I think it, it speaks to this so much about Anna's state. And it's David Foster Wallace, this um, about suicide. It's, it's short, so I just, the so-called psychotically depressed person who tries to kill herself doesn't do so out of hopelessness or any abstract conviction that life's assets and debits do not square, and surely not because death seems suddenly appealing. The person in whom its invisible agony reaches a certain unendurable level will kill herself the same way a trapped person will eventually jump from the window of a burning high rise. Make no mistake about people who leap from burning buildings. Their terror of falling from a great height is still just as great as it would be for you or me, standing speculatively at the same window, just checking out the view, i.e. the fear of falling remains a constant. The variable here is the other terror, the fire's flames. When the flames get close enough, falling to death becomes the slightly less terrible of two ter terrors. It's not desiring the fall, it's terror of the flames. Right. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Thank you all. We're out of time in a good way. Um, it's, thank you all for coming. And next week, um, I will see you again for the last session on this great, great book. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the contributions that many of you have made so generously to the library. We really appreciate it. See you Thank next you, Roxana. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.